Michael, our Archangel, different philosophers from all evil. Living Jesus, living Viva Jesus, Viva living Jesus, Philothea. Living Jesus, living Viva Jesus, Viva living Jesus, Philothea. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Amen. Spirit. Amen. Dear St. Francis de Sales, by your life and in your writings, you teach us to follow Christ by loving God our Father and all other persons, our brothers and sisters. Obtain for us the grace to be led by the Holy Spirit, so that we show our love for God by fidelity to prayer, by diligence in our work, by cheerful service of others. Teach us to be patient and forgiving, kind and helpful to all. Help us to face the difficulties and sufferings of life with a heart full of trust in God, our ever-loving Father. Dear St. Francis de Sales, while on earth, you are always ready to help those in need. Come to my aid and obtain for me from God, for the intercession of Our Lady, the special grace for which I now pray. Pray for the grace of discerning vocation as well as growing in holiness. For gentle St. Francis, bless our home with your presence. May our hearts glow with love for God and a sincere concern for others so that our lives may show in word and deed the blessings of your patronage. Amen. Mary, help of Christians, pray for us. St. Francis de Sales, pray for us. Welcome to the third section. And in this session, we are going to look at the birth, the family, the parents, and the birth and the growth of St. Francis de Sales. As I told you in the last ending, the father of Francis was Francois de Boisy. He was a general of the garrison guarding the pass from France to Switzerland. He was a great soldier, able administrator, but generally speaking, he was, he was struggling financially because of the political and economic conditions of that time, though he was from an aristocratic family. He took his wife along with the property and thus inherited the wife's name, the Sal. It is a mother's uh, therefore. And uh, the, the mother uh, was born in 1552 oh, and uh, at 14 she married Francois de Soir. She ma mothered 13 children, of whom five did not survive infancy. She was a very great woman. As you know, when people get married, and they become responsible. Though they are very young, they, she was very responsible. She was very pious, charitable. He cared for the poor, uh, uh, and the poor was always seeking uh, her assistance. Uh, Francis' full name is Franz, Francois, in English Francis, Venevantou de Salle. She, he was the firstborn in the family, prematurely born. She, the mother loved the son, called the jewel, cared for the mother. And he learned from the mother wonderful things. As you know, mothers are great teachers in the lives of children. And from the mother, he she he learned love of God, love of the poor and the needy, the mysteries of Christian faith, and it is from the mother that she, he learned uh, this beautiful way of of explaining faith through examples, especially found in nature in ordinary life. As you know, Jesus explained many mysteries of the kingdom through images, symbols, stories, etc., from ordinary life. Similarly, Francis' mother was greatly gifted. And this you know, will notice when you read Francis' uh, books, especially Introduction to the Divine Life, as well as the treatise on the love of God, you will notice that Francis is using a, 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 no ordinary, normal experiences of his time or ordinary books that people are reading and the stories from there to explain the mysteries of Christian faith. And that he learned from the mother. And this is Annecy, where Francis grew up. Francis uh, uh, studied what? He, he did his higher education uh, first in Paris, then in, 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 um, in France, and in Padua, in, in present-day Italy. In Paris, he did literature, philosophy, and arts, befitting nobles. That was the main uh, humanity, sciences, humanities that was, that was taught. And then in Padua, he did both civil and ecclesiastical law. 
and during this time she he underwent a terrible spiritual crisis which i shall explain a little later paris uh, in the university of paris students came from every part of the europe and they lived and circulated as, uh, among um, as na national groups. Those from the France, the French nation, they were called Gallicans, uh, Germans, uh, English, Scots. So uh, they grouped among themselves depending on from where they were coming from. And, uh, and the Calvin was greatly influential on the young people's minds. Calvin had taught using a writing, a section from St. Paul, of course, wrongly, that some are predestined for heaven, others are predestined for hell. In other words, the doctrine of election states that uh, if when God offers salvation, salvation is irresistible and therefore nobody will be able to reject it. But it is true that some people are not going to be saved, they are evil, and if so, the salvation was not offered to them, and hence, they, he said, Calvin said, some are predestined for heaven, others are not. And then Calvin went further and said, the Catholics, those who follow this religion of the Pope, they are predestined for hell, they will never go to heaven. So this is what worried Francis, will he and his family will go to heaven? Will they be saved uh, if uh, if what Luther, uh, what Calvin saying is right? And this was very strong in him. On one hand, he experienced within himself a great, strong, intense love for Jesus and Mary, and on the other hand, he was being being taught about predestination by students from from the Calvinist schools, young men, and he was afraid of losing God uh, because of the rejection by God. Uh, and it is our blessed mother who will help her, help him out. When he was undergoing this struggle, he went into the basilica, the cathedral there of Paris, knelt behind in front of the statue of our Blessed Mother and uh, recited the memorare, remember our most gracious Virgin Mary that never was it known. And suddenly he felt a light or a peace spreading through your soul and he was sure that he would not be condemned. And this is a prayer that he, he prayed. Lord, even if I am condemned to hate you for all eternity, Calvin saying Catholics are going to hell, allow me to love you with all my heart during this brief earthly existence. And then he received the light and he knew God is with him. And uh, he knew Calvin was wrong. His theory was wrong, but he did not know how to explain that one. But he, interiorly, he had this experience. He was very confident in God's love uh, uh, and God's presence. He found meaning, peace, etc. Now, what can we learn from this crisis of Francis? Now, all, everyone must undergo crisis. Everyone, it is inevitable. As long as we are human beings, crisis are necessary. Why? Without crisis, we cannot grow. Without crisis means hurdles. If there are no hurdles, you, we will never, we will never grow. We will never improve. You have seen how athletic athletes practice. No, if you are a runner, uh, how do you? win the race. Every day you have to run. If you ran for three kilometers today, tomorrow you must run for three and a half and then four. And this is how you build the stamina. If you are training for long jump, for instance, uh, you must keep jumping. So every time you jump, you go a little more uh, ahead uh, and, and uh, or, or the hurdles. Huh? You practice. So without this attempt to overcome the previous problem or limit, we, the person will not improve. So crises are important. It is a common. Everyone will face some sort of crisis. But it is an opportunity for growth, provided it is well managed. 
And what is the way to manage a crisis? Sincere seeking of the truth in prayer uh, is the key to us after prayer to consult people. Here, faith has an important role to play, that God will never let a person down in the time of crisis. Good. Now, from Paris, he moved to Padua, that is in uh, Italy now, and there he is doing law. Uh, his father wanted him, after his training, his uh, doctorate, he wanted him to be employed in the king's court, which was a prestigious job that he could easily get, to be employed in the court of the king, and uh, therefore he would be very influential. That was the dream of the father. Now, going to Padua, he found himself uh, in, uh, in an atmosphere where young people were uh, not any more respecting faith and the church, the Renaissance. They were more about uh, enjoying life, relaxed ways, liberal ways. Uh, they were not interested in learning faith and, and living a, a pride life. They wanted to enjoy whatever the new birth of Europe, meaning the cultural birth, the art, the music, the, the uh, different types of foods, etc., to enjoy. Francis had to be on his guard. Because he wanted to be faithful to God amidst the novelties and movements in that university town. And when some people tried to force him to enter into sexual relationship, etc., he had actually to use his wood uh, that was common those days to carry his wood to protect from uh, enemies uh, himself. And now it is here that he develops a love for uh, for scriptures, love for the word of God, love for studying theology, because he loved the word of God and wanted to learn theology. But he was there in Padua to study law, not theology. So he went to his spiritual director, Antonio Posavino, and said, I want to study theology. That is where my heart is moving. I, I crave to learn about the matters of faith. And here, the spiritual director gave him a very good advice. He said, now, you came here to study law, so commit yourself to, to study law. That is your duty, because that is your duty at the present time. And therefore, it is God's will for you for the time being. And this is a very important principle in spiritual life. Uh, if you are studying, and you are supposed to be studying, then that is your duty, not going out somewhere to help a poor person. Uh, though it is very good, even better than studying, but for you the duty is to study. So, the fulfilling one's duty, Francis would later teach his lay faithful, to the best of your ability, that is God's will for you. What is your duty? That is where you have to think and reflect and see. What is your duty? It often corresponds to your state of life, your job, your call to do, etc. At the same time, Father Antonio did not want to discourage him. He said, uh, it does not mean you don't study at all. Uh, you, in your free time, etc., read and study those things that you want to study, but on your own, with the help of someone. Uh, that should not be at the expense of your primary duty, which is to study law. So this is what he said. Life in the world is slippery and dangerous to you and for you to get lost. So, therefore, that desire that God has put into your heart is good, important. Go on, therefore, to think about divine things and study theology, but privately, personally. And he completes his studies. He received, therefore, very good education from two leading universities of that time. Uh, good religious and secular formation. He had the skill of court and nobility. Uh, and and uh, then he finishes. Now, Francis would emerge as someone who, who is capable of teaching us, the lay people especially, a spiritual lifestyle. Why? He never went to uh, a seminary, for seminaries were just beginning to sprout after the Council of 
of uh, a trend. Eh? So it was not common. Most of the priests were ordained without ever going to the seminary. And he was never part of a monastery. So his prayer life was what he learned from his mother and his family. And that is the prayer life that he will teach his people, his lay faithful, not something that he learned from the seminary or monasteries. And you'll be surprised how much the lay people those days prayed. When you read, when we, we shall see, when we read the introduction to the divine life, we will notice that they had, he's giving them a strict rhythm of prayer, meditation, <coughs> examination of conscience, and so on. <coughs> Anyway, he therefore teaches, uh, he has a path for the generations of ours who can grow in holiness through, through faithfulness to the ordinary life, the duties of ordinary life. Now, next is his struggle. He, on one hand, his father wants him to become a lawyer, and he has become already a lawyer, now only to take up a job. On the other hand, <coughs> the depth of his heart, he wants to be a priest. He was a firstborn, therefore, as the firstborn, he has the right to his family. And the father is offering a very good career, judge in Shambhari. And what to do? And in the, in the mind, he was very clear. He must give himself to God. But his father, his father, he is respecting his father. His father is not allowing him. So what did he do? Unlike Francis of Assisi, who threw away everything and walked out of his home, Francis de Sales waits, waits for God's grace to move his father, and waits for the hour when he will know, yes, it is now time to do what God wants me to do. So he was sure that he or, or should become a priest, but he was not at sure when she should take that step of leaving his home. And what happens? Uh, in that struggle, uh, he, as I told you, he was quite different from Francis of Assisi or St. Clair or Thomas Aquinas or Catherine of Siena. They decided immediately to leave their home. But he decides other way, work carefully and sensitively with his father. Now both are possible, eh? uh, but the, Francis, the style that Francis de Sales suggests is to go slow and wait for the time. Uh, and then finally, with the help of his mother, his mother was supportive. He, the, the, he insisted that he would like to become a priest. Uh, and there the father the father was angry, upset, but this is what he told his father. It is your duty to always think of God and to be a man of God. That is what you told me, and that is what I want to do. And slowly, also because of the influence of the bishop on the father's, uh, on the father's mind, the father finally allowed him. And on the 18th of December, 1593, the bishop, Grenier, ordained Francis to the priesthood. The images that you see there are the chalice and the pattern, etc., that was used on his ordination. And his principle, this is a very interesting and important principle in uh, spiritual life for him. Uh, when, you, when you know something is right and you should do that, you want to remain firm, firm as a rock. But if necessary, uh, allow time to mature the situation. Don't be... Uh, abrupt in this or presumptuous in uh, moving out, but uh, let God give you the opportunity to move out. Move out according to one's, no, uh, one's pace, uh, not according to one's pace, but in pace with God, when God will reveal you to do that. Now, uh, as now he's a, uh, uh, he's a priest, he's also the administrator, basically, uh, and he was very zealous. Now, this is another quality of his ministry, very zealous and apostolic person. He was very proactive. Because of his legal background, he decided to help the poor people with the legal advice and help. He was really an advocate for the people. Uh, he preached, he heard confession, he moved out, uh, visiting one community to another. 
uh, really a true genuine missionary. And it was in this when the bishop asked for volunteers to go to a place called Chablé. Chablé was under the diocese, but that area was was uh, ruled uh, before it was ruled by the Calvinists, the politi political leaders from the Calvinists, but now the army had liberated it from the Calvinists, but the, uh, the Christians, they continue to be Calvinists. And uh, the Catholics, you now the, the Catholic bishop was given the charge of reconverting them to Catholicism. And whenever any priest went there to preach to them, they were stoned and they were chased, uh, chased back. And now Francis is sent there to, to preach. And you see the images. Francis missionary call to preach to the people of Chablis. <coughs> And he volunteered. His father was very angry hearing that because he said, this man is going to be killed there. And he tried to prevent his son. He went to the bishop saying, this should not happen. You should not take my son there. But then the son said, it is not the bishop. It is me who wants to go there. And uh, of course, finally he went we, together with his cousin. Uh, they went on the 14th of September, 1859, 18, 1594. Hence, 14th, that is an exaltation of the cross. Yes, you know, the feast of the exaltation of the cross. 14th of September for us is important because that is where, where often we start our mission, ministry. Uh, a ministry that uh, emerged to be successful for Francis in Chablis. And we also often begin our ministries on the 14th of December. And this is the Chablis town you see far, and, uh, the present Chablis town. As you see the hill there on the one side, Thano, it was there the the castle or the, the the house where they could stay in the night, guarded, and then during the day he would uh, he would go to preach there. Chablis, as I said, had long embraced Calvinism. There was little trust between the people and the rest of the Duchy of Savoy, which had now become the rulers. Francis advised the bishop not to endorse the Duke plans to use military force to reconvert. And this is what Francis told the bishop. We need to break through the walls of Geneva through ardent prayer and assault their bulwarks with fraternal charity. It is by fraternal charity that our advances will become powerful. And that is a very important solution principle, that we overcome evil with prayer and with love, not with machine guns. These are some of the... Uh, this is a map coming from those days. Uh, uh, and then uh, Francis and his cousin with prayer preparing themselves to begin the mission. They reached well, the 14th and the 15th, they started going to um, going to Chablis. Some of the images from Chablis, the castle town, the church there of Hippolytus, the women of those days, and the church of Hippolytus. Uh, Francis went there every Sunday from September 18th. He preached the first sermon. And the, uh, the biographer says there were only about... Uh, seven or eight people in the church and the theme was on the shepherds of the church people threw stones uh, from outside of course and the people who were inside had to run for their lives and next sunday he tried again and it was now on the topic of visible nature of the church again into the sermon people from outside started throwing stones and they had to stop and the same thing happened uh, uh, on the third sunday and then the leaders of the town protested with oath that they would not allow him to preach any more sermon. But he went again on October 9th and preached. But the hostility was so much that he had to stop preaching. So what did he do? He did something very interesting. He changed his missionary tactic. He started writing down his sermons and reflections uh, on hand, and made handwritten copies. Of course, the printing press is just coming, but is not yet uh, uh, available. So he made copies of what he wanted to tell the people by writing and writing and writing. And then he would take them and slide them through the door 
uh, into a house. Uh, of course, he also did another strategy. He befriended the young boys. And with the boys, you know, boys are not uh, looking at what denomination they come from. As long as they see somebody friendly, they will also become friendly to them. So being friendly, he will walk along the streets uh, and the people did not therefore uh, worry much in the sense of they did not chase them away from there. And then with the children going there, he would then slide these writings into their house. Now, after a year, he was able to build an audience and engage the people of Shable in a discussion sh dialogue. They had many questions. Why, why Christian? Why the Catholics make the sign of the cross? Why are they keeping the crucifix, not the cross? Why are they praying to Mary? Why are they say, doing their adoration? So all these questions that you hear, the, the people had. And Francis answered them patiently, one by one. Now, the reformers, hearing that Chablet was returning to Catholicism, they sent the preachers to oppose him. And there would be public debates. And he would respond to the preacher's objection. And people listening to both, they came to recognize the truth. Uh, and finally, uh, through personal interviews, he would meet people on a person-to-person uh, -person basis. And friendship and love and his simplicity, he succeeded. Uh, and uh, he brought back the people of Chablais in three years, they were all back to Catholicism, over 70,000 Catholic Christians. Then in 1598, he was called back to Annecy because the bishop was very sick and he was given more uh, administrative duties of the diocese. And the bishop wanted him to be uh, to his successor. And so he, being chosen successor, and the Pope approved it. And uh, he was now uh, ordained as a successor on the 8th of December, 1600. And during the ordination, he says he had an experience, a mystical experience. As the three ordaining bishops, as you know, when a bishop is being ordained, there would be three bishops ordaining them. They suddenly felt, he was felt they are like the Holy Trinity. When, when the Archbishop imposed his hands on Francis, he became aware that God was entering into his soul, transforming it and making it the soul of the Good Shepherd. So there is an inner transformation or a happening <coughs> in the heart of Francis as the ordination ceremony is going on. Okay, this is the city of Geneva, the huge basilica of St. Peter there you can see in the painting. Uh, but the, the basilica was taken over, it still exists, but taken over by the Calvinists. They destroyed all the statues and images and uh, transformed it into a Protestant church. Then he founded uh, a special the Institute of the Visitation of the Blessed Virgin Mary in 1610. It was meant for young girls and widows who were not welcome in other communities because they were maybe physically defective or they liked not so healthy, etc. And so uh, Francis said, no, no, we must also give them the possibility of becoming consecrated souls. And Jane de Chantal, she was a very beautiful young lady <coughs> from aristocracy. That is her paint pay picture before. And then later, as a nun, she becomes the nun. And uh, it is from Jane de Chantal's writings that we come to know a lot about Francis. And this is what Jane de Chantal writes about Francis and about his experience of, uh, of the Trinity during the consecration. Um, when I was anointed bishop, God, Francis told Mother Chantal, took me to himself and away from my son. And then he gave me back to my people. That is to say, he changed me from being something in my own right to bring something that existed only for their sake. And so may we all be taken away from self and changed into him by the sovereign perfection of his holy love. This is what should happen in formation years and especially in prayer for you, for all of us. 
we are all very selfish people we are all seeking our own self glory and this is how we are born but slowly with the time we must learn we will be assisted by the holy spirit to die our own to ourselves to to renounce ourselves and our hearts to be transformed to be like the heart of jesus <coughs> So, uh, as bishop, he, he had many dreams. Uh, he was, first of all, he was a very good true pastor. He did, did not care. Uh, as a bishop, he was not sitting in his office. Of course, he did not have the real uh, bishop's house because his actual house in Geneva, it was under the Protestants. And here too, he did not stay in the, in the small office. He went around hearing confessions, giving spiritual direction, traveling on the horseback from one one um, uh, parish to another and when he reaches a parish he would call on the children and teach them catechism he was not afraid or ashamed to be a catechist he loved teaching catechism he was engaged in many activities therefore and solving numerous legal and other spiritual problems he established he wanted to establish a major seminary in his diocese but he did not succeed and he also began an institution of higher education with a kind of technical school but he did not succeed but later generations will succeed now uh, his final days on 27th december 1622 francis had an attack of apoplexy uh, uh, sickness that affects the interior organs of the person and he passed away on the 28th of december uh, and then uh, of course uh, then the burial took place it took a few days before he was buried he died in uh, lyon so the heart was buried but the body was brought to annecy he was a student forever he was a missionary a good preacher valuable spiritual director friend to many author founder mediator etc his spirit is a very simple endearing approachable gentle a person who had mastered especially impatience, anger, he was a very patient, gentle saint, devoted pastor. And he, as a, his influence is tremendous as a missionary, as a bishop, as a founder, as a director of souls, protector of the deaf. He is the patron of the deaf. For this reason, uh, he had a friend, a young, young man, who was always with him, taking care of him. He was a deaf boy. And this deaf boy was his best friend, as a, and he, he lived almost with him, and he protected him. Therefore, later, people recognize him as a protector of the deaf, doctor of the church. The Pope declared him the doctor because of his teaching. He is a patron of journalism and Catholic writers. Uh, these are his qualities that uh, we need to recall. A student, someone who studies all of his life, not as some other, some people these days, they study for the exam and then that is the end. No, no, for Francis, study is your, uh, he would say, the eighth sacrament. A priest, the eighth sacrament is your study. In the evangelizer, preacher, spiritual director, friend, author, peacemaker, as I told you, and a man who had arrived at a personal synthesis. And we stop there, the third section, and may Francis de Sales pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Francis of de Sales, we live your teachings through Philotheo. Live in Jesus, live in Viva Jesu, Viva, live in Jesus, Philotheo. Live in Jesus, live in Viva Jesu, Viva, live in Jesus, Philotheo.